and it's an absolute pleasure, Ruth, to welcome you um, to the National Māori Housing Conference, and I'll leave this panel in your capable hands. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, I think we'll just crack straight into it, actually. So, Robert, I think you're up first. Um, the idea was um, 10 minutes, um, and we'll probably boot you off after 10 minutes. We'll get you to wrap up so that we've got heaps of time for um, questions afterwards. So, um, I would like to introduce Robert Macbeth from TPK. I iwi, I nga reo, I nga mana. Um, him, um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, man, what a great conference. Um, it's been really, really great to see all these presentations and, and, and hear all the good examples that's going on around, around, the, around the motu and, um, and internationally. Um, it's a bit difficult for me up here because I've got my boss, Di, Di Grinnell, sitting out there. Um, um, what Jenny Sams didn't mention is that in a different, in a different life, um, she was also uh, my boss um, in the Department of Education and Training in, in Victoria for a, few, for a few years as well. So I've got, two ex, I've got an ex-boss and a current boss out there, and I've got all my Tapuni Kōkiri colleagues. And man, working in Tapuni Kōkiri, you can actually be absolutely be assured that you're going to get pretty honest feedback, so I've got to be on my toes. Hey, uh, um, uh, great night last night, and uh, went back to the hotel as you do, and I was putting together these slides, and I turned the TV on. The first thing that comes up was an announcement there's going to be a program coming up this week on um, building hemp homes. And I thought, wow. Um, reminds me of um, a, 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 a previous conference. I went back and turned the TV on, and there was Ruben on TV. So uh, sort of there's a bit of a message there. Hey, um, I noticed in the, on the tables yesterday there's this um, evaluation form and there's a question number six which says that we need a lead government agency in the Māori housing space to assist with collaboration and aligning strategies. And um, I'm just wondering whether we actually do need a lead government agency. We've had those before and I'm not sure that it worked very, very well. Um, our philosophy in Te Puni Kōkiri with the Māori Housing Network is that actually we don't want to be set up as a government lead. We don't want to be um, um, directing Māori housing solutions from, from, from Wellington or from our bureaucratic offices. Our job is to facilitate and support the great work and the knowledge that's out there in the community and, 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 and build that up. And um, picking up on what the minister said yesterday as well, when he, when he talked about the Māori housing network, it was originally going to be a Māori housing unit, and the idea of a unit starts to sound like a government lead agency, and the whole point of that was that we wanted to move away from that philosophy, because it hasn't really worked in the past. So the network is you. This is the network. Um, our job in the Māori housing network is, 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 is a bit of a facilitator of that, a supporter. You know, we might... Um, grease some wheels here and make, have some policy debate in, in, in Wellington with our colleagues. But, but the network is here. And in terms of um, a government lead, um, I guess uh, what I'd want to put out there is that my colleagues here, um, MSD, um, Housing New Zealand, the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment, they have a role here in the whole housing market as well. And we want them to take some responsibility for Māori housing as well. It's not just the Puni Kōkiri. Um, and, and it's only when we get that collaboration across government and with the network that you guys will we be able to still make, some, make some difference. But um, the idea of having Māori housing responsibility in Te Puni Kōkiri without the, the support and collaboration of all the other putia, which is a much bigger putia than what we've got from the other government agencies, um, is, 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 is not going to work for us, we don't think. So what I want to do is just quickly go through a little bit about our investment strategy and our investment plan for the Māori Housing Network to give you a bit of idea of how we do go about greasing the wheel and facilitating and supporting the great mahi that, that you do. Um, I should also say it's been really great because um, Di mentioned, um, you know, having fingers in the in the pie and, and being able to support. It's been really good to be able to sit on the sideline, as government officials should do, sit on the sideline and, and look at your celebra celebrations of your successes. And so, you know, we shouldn't be leading stuff like that. We should be sitting on the sideline and just sharing your celebration. And it's been really great seeing some of those fantastic papakainga 
um, developments and examples um, that have come across that that, that, were, that have been uh, presented in the last few days. And in some respects, yeah, we've been sort of sitting on the sidelines supporting those. And um, yeah, and um, even um, in, in Victoria, to have had that privilege of working with um, the Aboriginal community in, in Victoria to support them has been uh, was been fan been fantastic. I actually just picking up on that um, on the question around what did the government do um, to work in partnership with Aboriginal housing um, to get to the point where. Um, th that first stock transfer, and that what I mean is the, the leasehold transfer. There were three phases in the, in the memorandum of understanding, which from the government's part I helped um, pull together, but it was tenancy management, property management, and now what's happening is the actual transfer at nil consideration, because that's how stock transfers happen, aren't they, across the world. Um, um, but in that period of time, and, and I remember... Um, Having lots and lots of corridor with the with the board, you know, um, Uncle Trevor and Uncle Graham and and Tim and um, and what Aboriginal what the what the board was thinking was well we don't want to make a mistake here uh, we really need to build up our capacity and our support and I remember sitting in the office in Melbourne and there were people in the office of housing there who were saying oh let's just give it to them they'll fail and I say no. No, we're going to do this properly. We're going to work in partnership. This is, a, this is going to, how it's going to be. And um, we actually, as the Victorian government, we, as the Office of Housing, we put a lot of resources and effort into supporting the board, build up its capability, before the board said they were ready for that first transfer. Um, of, and, and I think that was really, really important. And I think we put in some significant millions of dollars into supporting the organisation before... They, they got that first uh, tenancy management responsibility. And that's capacity building. And I remember sitting in, in Melbourne saying, that's how it was done in the health sector in New Zealand. You know, build the capacity of the Māori health, health organisations and then transfer responsibility because they are then able to do it, um, do it, do it, do it well. And, and, I, and my philosophy was that the government has a responsibility to build that capacity. Um, so just Māori housing network, how does that work? So, picking up on the theme of collaboration and the fact that we are not responsible for everything to do with Māori housing and we can't do, do it on our own. Um, the Māori housing strategy, he Whare Ahuru, um, still is, is the government's approach for, for um, responding to Māori housing. If you've read the strategy and um, our, our previous minister, um, um, Honourable Tariana Turia, of course, uh, really got that got that through. It's a fantastic strategy. It's very ambitious. It covers the broad spectrum of Maori housing, from emergency housing crisis right through to supporting the an improvement in the statistics in terms of Maori home ownership. And so it's a really really broad strategy. So when we started with the Maori housing network, we sat down and we thought, well, we've got limited poot here, and I'll talk a little bit about that. What can we do to contribute to that strategy? You know, we, we, we can't solve the world, but we can, make a, we can try and make a difference in, in areas where we, um, where we have some expertise and where we can focus our putia. So what we, what we did was that, um, from that broad strategy, we thought that, well, what we, our, our main focus is contributing to whānau Māori living in safe, secure and healthy homes. That's sort of our vision. And somebody said the other day that, you know, vision statements are not easy to do. But we have three focus areas, improving the quality of housing for whānau, building the capability of whānau, hapu and iwi within the Māori housing sector, and also having a small role in increasing the supply of social and affordable housing for Māori. And I'll put that in the context of the small putia that we've got. Um, this is a, well, some, we, there's different names for this internally, and you know, I, I call it the Death Star. Um, um, but it just shows the broad, the broad nature when you actually look at Maori housing in the context of the whole Maori housing of the Maori housing sector and across the whole housing market, we understand that 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 there's really different roles across that top there. So right, right from the left is housing deprivation, right through to social and affordable rental, to assisted home ownership, to independent home ownership, and to capability building and support. And then we're working with individual Fano. And that's a new thing for us a little bit too, you know, actually supporting individual whānau who are coming to us. And then from Tapuni Kōkiri, that, that was a bit of a change um, in terms of putia going, going to individual whānau. 
uh, through Māori collectives, Māori organisations, and then working with other government agencies. So we sort of had to ma navigate our path within that, within that diagram as to where we have our main focus. And clearly our priority has to be at the, at the housing deprivation and the social and affordable um, rental space. There are other parts of government that are in the ho assisted home ownership, and, um, and, 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 and Mike will talk a little bit about, about that. This stuff is on our website, by the way, and um, in, in your packs, um, you've got a little bit of a booklet here called The Introduction to the Māori Housing Network. So I don't want to repeat all that, because that's all in there. But look at our website, it's pretty good. Um, just to put in context the, the, the putia that we got, um, at the, uh, so when we started, when we started one July last year, in the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, we had $6.8 million a year for Māori housing. $6.8 million a year. That was $4 million for the Māori, from the, for the Māori, what we called the Māori Housing Fund, and $2.8 million for Kainga Whenua Infrastructure Grants. That was immediately increased. Um, the Minister got through last budget, uh, got, got through some increase to about 14 point something million. Oh, we also had some small half a million dollars for shares funding that had been our, 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 our very highly regarded colleague Pauline Tangaho had been running for some time and many of you know Pauline. But, so we got, a, we got an increase and that was to really start to, us, to enable us to focus on getting into the housing repair kaupapa because we know that in addition to supplying a social and affordable housing. We know that there are many, many whānau, and I think the Minister referred to the 12,000 in the statistics um, of whānau living in, in, in really severe deprivation. This year we got some further increase in our budget and currently we have $17.641 million available to support Māori housing each year. Now, the good news is that that's ongoing funding. You know, gov future governments can change that, but at the moment it's not time limited. Um, there's a little thing in the forward estimates and the word called ongoing. So at the moment we're thinking we've got the ability to plan out here. We're not going to make a much difference in Māori housing in one, two or three years. This has to be a long-term plan and we're not going to really see some significant change with this limited putia maybe for five to ten years. So we've got to do our best with the limited putia but we do have the comfort knowing that at least we've got some continuity. Um, there's a number of different putia, and we're trying not to get you guys to focus too much on the particular, particular funds. It's not about applying for funds. It's about us working with you as individual whānau and as a raupu and actually understanding what it is you're wanting to do and then let us work out ways that we can package up the funding. But we do have particular funds as government appropriation um, works. We've got the Māori Housing Fund, Kainga Whenua Infrastructure Grant, Social Housing Shares Funding, um, and we've also got a new, the new one was the Māori Housing Network, and that's how we're funding our emergency housing and um, our housing repair kaupapa. So there's the three focus areas again. I've added there the fourth one. The Minister is, is, is very supportive of us supporting Māori organisations who want to get into the emergency housing space. Now, we've got to be real careful here because, as to Puni Kōkere, we are not the lead, lead agency responsible for emergency housing. Uh, Kay will be able to talk a little bit about, about that. Um, and nor do we have the, co the, have the ability to provide the ongoing operational funding that emergency housing is all about. You know, um, emergency housing is effectively people are not able to pay rent revenue or pay rent. So you've got to have operational funding. It's not just about the building. It's about the way that the bringing the wraparound support services and, and, and actually covering the cost of the operation. So what we're trying to do is say, well, with, that, with our limited putia, I mean, that's about $2 million a year, what we'll try and do is support Māori organisations and get them up to the point where they've got some emergency housing buildings and hopefully put them in a position where they can go and talk to MSD or um, the, um, the, the whānau ora commissioning agencies and seeing if they can get some operating funding to go along with it. The way we work, and, and I've had a few questions over the last couple of days about how, how you engage with Te Puni Kōkori, very much we've moved away, deliberately moved away from the old days of application forms that some of you might have known from the old social housing unit. Um, and we've moved away from funding rounds um, so that it's not really a competitive um, approach. 
Actually, it is cool. Um, what we want to do is be pretty much engage with Fano and Ropu at an early stage and have these early conversations about what your housing aspirations and needs are, and then we can work with you to support a solution. And, and if you talk, we've, we've had a lot of kōrero around papakāinga housing in the last, the last few days, and generally I think our experience of papakāinga housing is that there's a lot of work at the early stage and actually really understanding what it is as a, as, a, as a community you want to do, whether you want to build rental housing or support whānau into home ownership on the Māori whenua or, um, or, or, or not. And that's where the papakāinga workshops really come in because it helps you get to that point of, of understanding what you're wanting to do. We also know from hard experience that having decided that's what you want to do, to get to the point of having a project that's shovel ready, there's a lot of um, expense and really that's where the hard mahi has to, has to come in. You've got to get through the resource consent issues, you've got to do all that financial analysis, um, you've got to get geotechnicals and it can cost a lot of money. So we're at that point where we're, we're able to support the project feasibility um, for, for those projects. And then once the project feasibility is done and you've got a project that is ready to go, then you come and have a conversation with us um, about potential support for infrastructure and if it's rental housing, maybe some capital grant to support the financial um, viability of that rental housing. But pretty much it's a community-based approach, kanahiki to kanahi, um, come and talk to us and we'll try and work out a way forward. Now, with our limited putia, we're not going to be able to do everything in any one year. It's really about programming it, having a pipeline of projects and really understanding more about the timing. Um, and, and as Di mentioned before too, one of the big things that's really coming to bit of, come big pressure that we are identifying is the whānau in communities with real serious deprivation. And so how do we go into those communities and support those whānau to repair those houses given the extent of the need? And we've got to really program that out and think long term. Thank you, um, Robert, and um, no apologies for being really mean. I'm really trying hard to make sure we've got time for some discussions. So without further ado, um, I'd like to um, welcome Mike Weber from Housing New Zealand. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Weber. I'm from Housing New Zealand, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, Kainga Whenua, as you can see on the slide. If I get this working, great. So what is Kainga Whenua? Well, Kainga Whenua is a home loan that can be used to build, to purchase an existing house or to relocate a property onto multiple owned Maori land. It's also available for repairs and maintenance. So the purpose of Kainga Whenua. So the idea with Kainga Whenua is because many banks are, are reluctant to lend against Maori land, then the idea with Kainga Whenua is it was introduced to provide access to finance for those people that wish to build on or relocate properties to their multiple own Maori land. So that's a, ve a very singular purpose for Kainga Whenua. So the key features of Kainga Whenua, with a Kainga Whenua loan you can borrow up to 100% of the building cost or the purchase price and you know, the reality is in today's environment that uh, it's pretty difficult to, to live with a $200,000 maximum loan amount, but uh, that is the loan amount that we uh, have as our cap, but we're able to consider exemptions to that in a number of instances we have provided exemptions to that loan amount, but there is a nominal $200,000 loan limit. And with Kainga Whenua, uh, it comes with uh, Kiwi Bank don't charge any application fee for a Kainga Whenua loan, and it comes with market interest rates. So there's no uh, higher interest rate because they're the only lender in this market. It's a market interest rate that's applied. So how it works. So with Kainga Whenua, Housing New Zealand, not Kiwi Bank, Housing New Zealand take security over the, uh, the house only and not the land. And of course the key benefit that that delivers for borrowers is, and occupiers is that the land, their land, is never at risk of being lost through this loan. So even if a loan defaults, the land can never be lost. Other than that, uh, what Kiwi Bank and Housing New Zealand have tried to, to do, endeavoured to do with the Kainga Whenua loan, 
is to make that loan as uh, similar as possible to a standard bank loan that Kiwi Bank provides. So they try and uh, do that in terms of the documentation they produce, the application process that Kiwi Bank uh, assess an application through. So the idea is that other than that access to finance the, that otherwise wouldn't be available, that the loan is a similar loan that Kiwi Bank uh, provide to what people can get for, uh, for general land. So it's, I think it's worthwhile, often the audiences that I talk to about Kainga Whenua have some misapprehensions about Kainga Whenua. And uh, so what I wanted to do was to actually specify a few things that Kainga Whenua isn't. So it's not a grant, it's not a subsidy. Since the introduction of the Kainga Whenua infrastructure grant, I've, I feel calls well, perhaps not every week, but certainly every month with people wanting to apply for a, a Kainga Whenua grant from Housing New Zealand, which of course, as Robert said, is, is part of the stable of uh, offerings that uh, the Māori Housing Network provide. So it's not a grant, it's not a subsidy, and it also doesn't have uh, below market interest rates. They are market interest rates that apply, and in line with the idea that it's a a standard bank loan as far as Kiwi Bank are concerned, the criteria that's applied, those lending criteria, is consistent with the other loans that they provide. So it doesn't have lower uh, entry level, I guess, uh, into getting there in terms of the lending standards that are applied. So the eligibility criteria, it's got to be multiple own Maori land. So that includes uh, land that has been received by Iwi and Harpu as part of the the treaty settlement process, so it includes that as well. Applicants need to meet Kiwi Bank standard lending criteria, and at least one borrower can, has to be a full-time occupier of the property. So the great advantage of that is that other people can, uh, family members can contribute to the repayment of the loan without actually having to reside in the property. So it allows the greater uh, family to be able to contribute to the repayment of that loan. There's no income caps and there's no need for uh, the borrower to be a first home buyer. So they can be a, a previous home buyer and still apply for a, a Kainga Whenua loan and be eligible. So also they need to sign a licence to occupy and that's a, an agreement between the uh, occupier and, or borrower, occupier slash borrower and the landowners and Housing New Zealand uh, won't be a signatory to the, or isn't a signatory to the licence to occupy, and then the Kainga Whenua Agreement, which is between the occupier, the landowners, and Housing New Zealand. And it's the Kainga Whenua Agreement, I'll talk a little bit that, uh, more about that in a few slides' time, but that's the security arrangements that the, the loan is provided under. Okay, so there's also property criteria, and to, for a property to be eligible for a Kainga Whenua loan, the property has to be movable. So it has to be single storey built on piles. And again, uh, Housing New Zealand is able to consider exemptions to that criteria where an alternative asset can be provided that's, uh, that's acceptable to Housing New Zealand. The site on which the house is to be located uh, has to be accessible by road and has to be located on either the North or the South Island. And that's obviously to be able to uh, retrieve the house in the event that the, the loan fails and we'd hope that it would never come to that and thus far it, it never has. So there's two types of Kainga Whenua loans, firstly the loans to individuals which was the original Kainga Whenua loan product that was developed and that's for obviously for home ownership for individuals and under a, a new application process that I'll talk about shortly uh, then the the entry point for that is going to be a registration of interest with Housing New Zealand. Currently, it's a matter of knocking on the door of Kiwi Bank. The second type of Kainga Whenua loan is that to Māori land trusts and other collectives. And for that, the, uh, the trust or collective can on-sell those properties or indeed they can hang on to them and use them as social rental or even market rental properties. So they could do either of those things. And the application for that, again, is uh, through Housing New Zealand. On the Housing New Zealand website, there's a registration of interest form that uh, inquirers uh, complete, and that's uh, how they apply for a Kainga Whenua loan. OK, so the thing I really wanted to talk to today was about some changes that are happening uh, or going to be happening, have either happened or, or will be coming on board shortly 
to changes to the scheme. Firstly is the process of application for individuals. What we're doing is re-engineering that process with the idea of providing a better customer experience. We've had some instances in the past where uh, people have applied through Kiwi Bank and they've kind of got lost in the process and they speak to someone at Kiwi Bank who doesn't know much about it and they kind of get lost in that whole process and to be fair, Kiwi Bank do a little bit as well. Uh, and that revised process will be engineered also in a way that allows Housing New Zealand to better monitor uh, what's going on with a particular application and follow it through the process and provide support where it's needed and where we can provide that support to applicants through that process. So that's the idea behind um, what we see as quite a significant change to improve the Kaying and Whenua scheme. The second thing that we're doing in the process of developing at the moment is producing an online pre-qualification assessment tool. And that will be a, a tool that will allow potential applicants or even interested people to be able to go online and assess their eligibility in their eyes uh, for a kind of whenua loan. So it means that somebody that's interested can, can test the water without needing to go to Kiwi Bank and go through a formal application process. The idea is that it gives an indication of uh, whether somebody is, is likely to be eligible for a loan. And I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. The next change that we've got is the tripartite deed that has been around for a long time has now been split into uh, two separate documents. Uh, and the idea behind that is to give greater flexibility to, to both the occupier and the land trust in being able to provide a licence to occupy that's perhaps more uh, applicable for what they want to do and what the agreement by which they provide the occupation right. So that's uh, something that's happening now. The fourth change is evaluation requirement. We had a lot of, I guess, uh, issues with evaluation with Kainga Whenua in the past. So what we've done is uh, simplified the process with the idea being not only to make it a simple or more simple process for applicants, but also to cut a lot of cost. And then uh, lastly, we're going to be producing and updating the, the look and feel as marketers would say, uh, with a kind of Whenua scheme with a new booklet that's going to be worked on in the coming couple of months. So just to go through the first of those changes, so the new application process. So this is where applicants, rather than going to Kiwi Bank and calling up their 0508 number or going into the local post bank shop, what they will do is that they'll, they'll call or email Housing New Zealand to register an interest. In that first uh, contact point, Housing New Zealand will be able to provide answers to questions, what I've called generic questions. Uh, so they're questions related to the scheme and how it works and what would happen if. So I'm going to have to go quick. Uh, and so that won't be detailed uh, answering of questions, but the idea is that it provides um, the first bit of information. And then the critical bit, I think, in this process is that Housing New Zealand will actually take the initiative and in connecting the applicant with the Kiwi Bank lender, so the Kiwi Bank person that's operating in that particular area. So we will kind of handshake them across and so that uh, they don't get lost in the process as can happen at the moment. Then they go through the existing process, Kiwi Bank goes through a pre-approval process uh, and again that's aligned with what Kiwi Bank do for any uh, home loan application that they get. We would then suggest that the the occupier and the landowner go through a, the licence to occupy at that point and agree that, then get on to designing the house, uh, creating a building plan and a budget, etc. Back to Kiwi Bank to finalise that and get that uh, final loan approval from Kiwi Bank. And then where we would have produced the tripartite agreement, we will produce the uh, Kainga Whenua agreement and the licence to occupy that will have been executed earlier or even at that point will form an appendice to that document. Then it goes to the Māori Land Court and build commences. So in terms of trusts, there's an unchanged process here. Uh, those trusts that are interested in uh, a kind of federal loan register an interest on the Housing New Zealand website. Then there's a high level uh, financial evaluation by Housing New Zealand uh, and more particularly Kiwi Bank and then they work through that process uh, as a business banking application with, with Kiwi Bank and through to loan approval. 
So that pre-qualification assessment tool, the second of those changes, the idea with this tool is that it allows an interested uh, or a potential applicant to really ask a couple of questions. Am I likely to be eligible for a Kainga Whenua loan? So it allows them to self-assess against the criteria that exists for the scheme. And then, and I think really importantly, it then al allows them to uh, use an online calculator that we're in the process of developing, which will give them an indication of how much they could expect to borrow in their circumstances. The idea is that they will be able to vary some of that financial information that they input into the tool that would give them a different amount that they could borrow depending on what their circumstances are. So the idea, I guess, if you visualise, if somebody's got uh, a debt at the moment of $10,000, how much more would I be able to borrow if I managed to reduce that debt to, say, $1,000? So the idea is that it will give some of that um, answers to how somebody can improve their own circumstances to maximise the amount that they could borrow. And then it will point people in the direction of where do you go from here. Next, uh, I wanted to talk about was the licence to occupy. So I mentioned that the tripartite deed has been replaced. So there's two separate documents there, a licence to occupy, and I'm not going to cover the detail. Then the Kainga Whenua Agreement, which is the security aspects of the existing tripartite deed. And then the valuation change. So the change here, and I go through it really quickly, is that currently, there, or sorry, previously there'd been a requirement that you got valuation done at proposal, through the build, and then at completion. Now there's only one valuation that's required, and that's at the time of application. And uh, you don't have to go through the solicitor's trust account in order to pay the invoices, so that saves money as well. And then my last slide. Uh, is a new booklet that um, will be coming out. It's in the early stage of the design process. It's going to pick up all of these changes, and I'd expect to see that, uh, that booklet becoming available both in a printed form and online within the next uh, couple of months. Okay. That's me. Thank you. Um, as soon as we've got through the last speaker, that's why I'm rushing them all through, so there's heaps of time for questions. So um, finally, I'd like to um, welcome Kay Reid um, from MSD, and um, I'll just hand straight over to you. Uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, ko putaua ki te maunga, ko rangatai ki te awa, ko rangituku te tangata, ko koko hino te marae, ko na, te pahipoto te hapu, uh, ko Ngāti Awa Te Iwi, uh, ko Ngāti Pikiao, Ngāti Mahuta, Ngāti Mane Poto Oku Iwi Hoki, ko tēnei taha tōku māma, ko Kapu Te Rangi, te Maunga, ko Ohangia Mataro, te Awa, ko Wairaka, te Tangata, ko Wairaka, te Marae, ko Ngāti Hokupu, te Hapu, ko Ngāti Awa Te Iwi, ko Whakatohia, me, to, me Tūhoi, Oku Iwi Hoki, tēnei taha tōku pāpa. Ko Kay Reid tōku ingoa, uh, te mana tū uh, whakahi ato ora. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou. So today I'm going to talk about um, our role in terms of the social housing reform program. If we look at this, this diagram, actually I think the most important piece is the piece in the middle, which is about people and it is the role of a number of agencies to actually support and enable those people. So basically the reform program is designed, it is a cross-agency approach to improve the provision of social housing in New Zealand. That's actually the output. The actual outcomes we're looking for is to improve the well-being of individuals and whānau and actually increase the investment or the return of investment that government makes in social housing for actually New Zealand Inc. So we have a number of agencies, as I said, we've got Mike and Robert here today, two of my colleagues. MB, they weren't here today, but just to be clear about their role, they in fact are the lead agency in terms of being the regulatory authority. So all of you who are in fact signed up to be community housing providers, they make sure that actually you've got the right support and the right mechanisms to make sure that you can actually operate in this environment. They also have the link to affordable housing, which we've heard more about over the last three days, 
and to the availability of Crown land. Our other colleagues are Treasury. They, of course, provide independent advice on the cost effectiveness of the various programs that actually come out of government. And interesting, off the back of Jenny's corridor in terms of their stock transfer, actually the difference here in New Zealand is Treasury actually manage the formal commercial transactions process around the transfer. So I think there is a point of difference. In Australia, it is a stock transfer. Here in New Zealand, at this point in time, it is a commercial transaction. So I thought I'd tell you that. So our role, specifically, is to be the lead emergency and social housing agency. We have been now set up to be the single purchaser of government-funded social housing places and support services for people with serious housing needs. The way we're seeking to do that is to integrate social housing into the welfare approach that MSD is taking. So just to give you a couple of key pieces of data, at the end of August uh, 2016, there were approximately 64,000 social housing places currently delivered by Housing New Zealand. In the community housing provider space, there's approximately 3,000 spaces. So quite a difference. So yesterday, Minister Bennett set out the government's social housing reform pro program objectives. I won't read them out to you. But really what I wanted to focus on, the outcomes that we're proposing to achieve. Because you might ask, OK, we've got these objectives. You might ask the questions, really relevant. So what and what? So securing additional supply. That means more housing and greater certainty of the supply of social housing. It's the first, first outcome we're looking for. Improving client outcomes. So the way we're proposing to do that is to trial some new approaches, new initiatives. Housing first is one of those. The second one we're looking at is actually sustaining tenancies. We're seeking to do that in a co-design approach, so working with the sector rather than government sitting in our office saying this is how we're going to do it. Greater clarity around performance expectations of Housing New Zealand and the community housing providers and government to make sure actually we're enabling the sector and actually enabling cl client outcomes. Better utilisation of properties. We currently have a mismatch. So we have both underutilisation in housing New Zealand properties and overcrowding. And so we need to shift that. Moving supply to more affordable locations. And I'll just reflect back on when Mangatawa Papa Moore spoke yesterday in terms of what they're proposing to do. Actually, sometimes you have to sell and create cash to actually invest in a different space. That, that, that's exactly what government is proposing to do. Selling high value land placements to be able to purchase in other more affordable locations and creating more housing. So utilising the Crown land holdings more effectively. In terms of MSD's functional role and our functional view, I'll just pick a couple of, um, of these spaces. It is social housing policy with the big P. And I guess if I can give some advice to, to this forum and to the strategy actually to really make a difference, that's the, where the engagement needs to occur in the big P space. So it's in the area of purchasing intentions. Where do we need housing? What's the type of configuration we need that housing to be? Again, I'll refer back to what Jenny talked about where she talked about doing some spatial analysis of where there's capacity in the ground, where there's transport corridors, where there's schools and health services, to be able to make sure that where we're placing houses, it's easier for those clients who actually need that support. The other opportunity would be in relation to the income-related uh, rent subsidy. So again, we heard, heard back, and I'll go back to the Mangatawa Papa Moore, presentation is actually leveraging off. You get a mortgage to develop housing, you have to repay that, it is a commercial transaction, but actually ultimately accessing that subsidy to be able to pay that. 
therefore sustaining also housing for your own people. So that's just a couple of things I just wanted to mention. From the client view, which is most important. So what are we doing? Ultimately, our prize is actually to move as many individual clients and families along that continuum. The best place for people to be, of course, is self-determination, being in their own property, own, on their own whenua. And we heard over the last two days so many, many successful examples of that. And that's what we as government need to be able to enable. Of course, at the other end, the reality is we do have a number of individuals and whānau who need emergency housing support and social housing. With that, we need to link it to the affordable housing space, because what's happening now, especially in Auckland, as we know, I'll be speaking here to people who are already well aware of that, because of the market, we're squeezing people out of the affordable housing space. Therefore, they are putting pressure on the social housing space. Therefore, they are putting pressure on the emergency housing space. I'm not going to repeat what the minister said yesterday, but basically the other elements are is how we in MSD use all of the levers that we have to actually support clients to make better decisions and to sustain their, their current housing. In terms of transforming social housing, a couple of points I wanted to mention here is back in 2014, this government decided they want to separate uh, the two functions of actually being a purchaser of social housing and a provider. First point, the second point is to open up the market, to have a more competitive market and therefore introduce community housing providers to be able to challenge and test the value housing New Zealand actually has in New Zealand. Of course, that is ambitious, and that's going to take at least 10 years to actually get some equilibrium in terms of that market space. So it's very slow, it'll be incremental. The second point, though, which I think is, is more important, is actually purchasing intentions. So again, you might think, and what, so what, what does that mean? It actually is about taking an investment approach, understanding our client segmentation, understanding spatial infrastructure, where we can actually afford to have housing, and actually setting out what those requirements look like and how much the Crown is prepared to pay for them. Again, Minister Bennett talked about that yesterday. And we're doing that through some initiatives in both um, Christchurch and Auckland. We've put out some RFPs to create more of a market and introduce new players into that market. Again, I'll go back and just state it's going to be incremental change that, that will make that happen. It won't happen overnight. The last piece I really wanted to talk about, and this is probably the most important piece is taking an investment approach. So what MSD did with, its, uh, with the whole welfare approach was we actually recruited in uh, Taylor Fry who actually uh, developed an actuarial model. So they look at the liability or the cost of the welfare model. They're doing that now with the social housing model. How much projecting out over years will it cost government and actually, is that cost and is that investment the best approach to get the right outcomes? And what we're proposing to do is use the welfare model and the social housing valuation model, bring the two pieces together to actually make much better evidence-based decisions, because right now we're not doing that. That's the approach we're going to take. So that will help to inform our purchasing intentions. It will give you, who want to be part of the market, greater clarity and visibility of what we're proposing to do and why, and how you actually get into that market. Kia ora. Kia ora, okay. um, Right, so now we have got a good amount of time left for questions and um, discussions. So I will start with the gentleman down on the left end. The way it's going to work, there's a couple of um, 
runners around the side with microphones so that we can all hear. Yep, it's on its way. Um, and I think we might have to cluster around here so people can hear you. So uh, if you want to come up here, I think it might be quick. Oh, you've got one there. Up by ready? Kia ora tato. I want to uh, kia ora Mike Weber. Uh, in regards to the kainga whenua, I've got a few questions. My first one was, because I've heard this presentation down in Whanganui two years ago, me and Piri heard you say the same thing. I want to ask how many houses have actually uh, been successful in going through that loans process since um, two years ago? Oh, I th can you hear me? Is yep. that on? Yep. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact number, but I think we're in the region of 18 to 20 uh, loans. Okay, um, in two years. Okay, we, from what I heard from Tariana back in Wanganui, she was trying really hard to improve on that, uh, on that amount. I think previous to that, there was like nine. So you've improved, well, well not too bad, I suppose. You've doubled the number. Um, the other one is, uh, have you got any comments about uh, KiwiSaver access to the whanau who want to uh, consider your loan? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by what comments I have, but I know that the up until a few months ago, the legislation, the KiwiSaver legislation, was written in such a way that people that wanted to uh, build on Maori land were uh, not necessarily able to access their KiwiSaver funds in order to, to do that. There was a legislated change a few months ago that enabled that, so people are able to access KiwiSaver funds to build on Maori land now. Hang on, my wife's going to talk about that. i got one more. Do you think it's discriminatory to our people when you believe that they can't pay the loan, so straight away you put a negative on your loan process by saying that they can only build on um, piles? The, the, the requirement to build on piles is so that the... Uh, that there's a the, the way that the arrangement works is that housing New Zealand because you can't, we can't take security over the land we have to take security over uh, another asset and by separating the house from the land via piles enables it to, and the court to uh, to recognise the house as a chattel and therefore separate from the land and allows housing New Zealand to take security over that land so. If the house uh, is attached to the land in the way of uh, a concrete uh, floor, for example, then it's no longer regarded as a chattel and cannot easily be separated uh, in terms of a legal definition. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, didn't answer anything. Right. Um, oh, down the, down, down the front here. Sorry, sorry. Can I make some comments? Uh, yeah, no, I, I know where you're coming from, from, from Ruben, and I guess one of the things that, that we are finding is the Māori Housing Network, and, and certainly our minister is really concerned about it as well. When our team goes out there and they're talking to Fano, we're coming across a lot of issues around the Kainga Whenua Loan Scheme. Part of the problem, I suppose, is that the Kainga Whenua Loan Scheme was an adjunct to the Welcome Home Loan Scheme, and basically it was making Welcome Home Loans available for Māori land. It's not a home ownership assistance program, and that's part of the problem. People were sort of expected to be a home ownership assistance program, but it's not. And um, you're trying to trying to um, make it something that it, that it's not that was never intended. That doesn't answer the question, though, because what do we do to support Fano into home ownership? And and possibly uh, kind of Fano loans is not the answer for that. What we can say is I actually had a look at it, and um, uh, since the introduction by the government, and this was one of um, on, um, Tariana Turia's introductions, the Kainga Whenua Infrastructure Grant Program, that was intended to and try and at least come across, uh, get rid of some of the barriers for, for whānau getting access to Kainga Whenua loans. And I suspect, having looked at it, that pretty much every loan that's been approved in the last uh, little while um, has actually received a complementary kind of federal infrastructure grant. So it sounds like we're starting to make a bit of a difference, but it's not the be all and end all. And we've got some, um, I've got an, we've got an Ahu Whenua Trust at the moment who uh, wants to do a Papa Kainga development. And um, they've, they've, they're talking to us about a capital grant for that and a Kainga Whenua infrastructure grant. 
we know from the financials that they can actually support some borrowing, even for rental housing, which is car pie. The more co-contribution, the more our limited puti you can go. But because they're building Fariuku, they can't get, get access to a kind of whenua loan, which seems to defeat the purpose a bit. And that's only a 20% 20% loan, 80% grant. Um, so yeah, I think we all recognise there's some issues there. Thanks, Robert. Uh, we'll um, go over um, here, and then um, you, then over here. Uh, My name is Fred Sadler. I'm with uh, Northland Housing Forum and Te Hauoro Ongapui. I, I listened to the answers in regard to you've been in operation since 2010, and it's six years since the product was introduced. Um, in, in order for, for Māori to be able to to use that loan, we need to earn between fifty to seventy thousand dollars to be able to service that loan. So it makes it rather difficult when, when the medium wage, uh, um, wage in in Tai is twenty five thousand dollars. So the other thing, uh, Mike, is when I was in Wellington with Tari Anatulia, when you came up to Whangarei, I said to you that it was a failure. It wouldn't meet the, the affordability for, for Māori land. And I think the figures that you've just given is indicative of, of the fact that it hasn't worked. It's a failure to, to deliver affordable housing to our, uh, to our Māori people. Um, the other issue is in regards to to licenses to occupy under tripartite deed arrangement. Um, there is another um, product that's um, used by the, by the Māori Land Court under Section 328 of the Act, and that is with occupation orders, which gives, gives the opportunity for, for you, in any case, to enter upon the land because it, it gives the... the the applicant the right to build a house upon the land and have the invitees come across the balance of the land should you wish to remove the, the, the asset. So I just need to get some clarity on that. Okay. Uh, in terms of the, uh, just the, the first point you made, the as far as the kind of funeral loan is concerned, I guess I, I in terms of, I appreciate where you're coming from. There's a low number of loans that have been made. Uh, I think that the important point to bear in mind in defence of Kainga Whenua is that it was intended to provide access to finance that wasn't otherwise available. It was never intended as a social housing program. It was never intended as a, a subsidised program uh, to provide, a, you know, a... Um, a lower cost housing, it was simply around providing access to finance and that's all that it's endeavoured to do. It hasn't been uh, designed in such a way that reduces the cost of uh, housing, it's just an enabler in terms of where uh, access to finance is otherwise unavailable and uh, it, it, it has a very narrow mandate and that um, I guess uh, hasn't necessarily helped a whole lot. In terms of the second point, uh, with regards to the occupation order, uh, I guess this is an ongoing um, discussion point. Uh, I remember it coming up in the uh, conference in Wellington about th three or four years ago. And this is something that's been researched extensively, and I know because I've been involved, and occupation orders simply don't work. I'm happy to have a discussion with you afterwards and, and explain what I... Uh, I know of that, but uh, we have had discussions. It's gone to the Crown Law Office. The Crown Law Office have confirmed that the only way that you can make this work is a licence to occupy. Thanks. Right, we've got two down here and then a gentleman over here. So. Uh, kia ora, Rosina Hawiti, journalist. I'm writing an article for Mana Magazine. My uh, questions are directed to Kay. Um, Kay, in the... Um, uh, one of the things you talked about was on a... a a slide graph there where people, our people would go from emergency to social to private rental. 
Um, now, in between that sector, between social and private rental, there are, there's a huge gap. Um, my first question is, how do you imagine that our people, with the circumstances that they have, are going to make the transition from social to private rental? Um, my other question, uh, sorry, um, also connects to that, is in around the, the, the fallout and the absolute uh, devastation that has been caused to some families in the sample range that we have taken, who have been moved on from Housing New Zealand um, accommodation because they no longer fit. Um, and when we had a look, within our sample range of 20, there were nine who had members that were caring for others. So, but I do understand that those are individual cases, but I want to know how thorough um, and how much information is actually given to the tenants that, so that they, can, they are aware of their rights. Kia ora. So if I answer the second question first in, in terms of how much information is provided uh, to people, I guess two points. Are you talking first about the tenancy review process? Is that what you're asking? So we, we give people comprehensive inf information in terms of what their rights are. So it's, it's a long process that occurs in terms of those tenancy reviews. And actually, a number of people have, in fact, gone on to home ownership. So how, these, how many? I think it was 113 that have gone on to home ownership. I'll just have to have a look. I'll and how many that. were made homeless thereafter? Because we have some stats here, and I'm just wondering whether you were aware. Well, from our perspective, no, no people get moved on to be made homeless. If they're still eligible for social housing, they remain in social housing. Um, oh, well, I beg to differ. I, you know, I'm, excuse me, but in the st statistics that we took, there are a number of people, and I'm talking about Auckland, um, who were moved out of social housing and are now in substandard housing or are homeless. So if you're talking about individual cases, actually I'm not going to answer that question Cowboy. here today. Cowboy. Apologies, but that's not what we're here for. Actually, if I talk about what tenancy reviews are designed to do, is to actually make sure that those who are eligible for social housing actually stay in social housing. Tenancy reviews are not designed to actually displace people and put people at risk and make them homeless. So if something's happened and you have the detail of those individual cases, I'm happy to talk with you offline or you can contact us, but I'm not going to talk about individual cases here today. Kia ora. Now, sorry, what was your first question? My question was um, how... Oh, the movement. Yeah, the, yeah, the transition. The movement. So, so, so two, two, two things is actually social housing is designed to actually be fit for purpose for people who actually require social housing. When people are in a position to afford private rentals or even home ownership, that's, the, that's what we do to move them on. So we do have uh, rent, rent uh, advances, bonds. There are people, in fact, in, have been in houses and housing New Zealand properties, ultimately, who pay what's called a market rent. So they can afford to actually pay in the market. And we will support them to actually move on. So we will give them, for instance, a written reference to a landlord. We don't just displace them we support them to actually move on. So it's rent in advance, bond in advance, we'll do all of those types, provide them with support services, but generally that pool of people, and there's not a huge number, to be honest, that pool of people are actually able to actually move into private rentals. Kia ora. Right, we'll go over here and then back over there, and then down the back. Kia ora koutou, wubi te kanoa. Um, but I want to stand up and just be too negative because there's a lot of things I could say, but I really want to be focused on solutions. Um, and what I want to talk about is policy and strategy. So uh, there's a white elephant in the room. There's a political election next year, and each of those political parties has their own view on what housing strategy should be. Now. I just want to get an indication from the room. How many people in this room think the strategy should come from us and not the political parties? Can you raise your hands? Cool. Thank you. So, that being said, who drives our strategy for us? 
who is the, who is, who is the agency that's going to carry our waka? Because I think we should be saying what the strategy is, not the political parties and certainly not the government agencies. That's my view. Now, if it's coming from a commercial sector for housing, government won't listen, political parties won't listen. But if it's coming from this sector, it's very hard to ignore because we're in the place where there is need. Um, so what I'm proposing is that there needs to be policy representation for us, lobbying for us. Um, and I want to ask the sector who's prepared to stand up and carry that waka for us. And I think it can't be just, maybe not just one entity, maybe it's going to be a collaboration. So I'm going to challenge all of the agencies out there um, where the culture really does each strategy. So I'm going to challenge you whether your whakawhanaungatanga and your kotahitanga can help you drive our strategy for us. So I'd like to hear who's going to step up. Um, so to, to yourself, um, Mike, we have to resolve this issue around building on concrete foundations on Māori land because there's uh, extra costs involved when you're building on piles. So we have to get to a point where we can underwrite those loans. So uh, what I'd like to know is what are the strategies, who are you talking to, is there stuff going on, is there a person you can talk to where we can come together and come up with a strategy to underwrite these loans? Because I've been talking with, had, having chats with other banks and they're saying we want to do these loans on Māori land but we don't know how. Um, so they're asking how they can get in and, and do these loans. So I'd really be interested in who, who, who can you talk to, who would be prepared to um, underwrite these loans, because that could be an avenue where we can get those loans out and they're covered for, for the security purposes. And there's one question for the lady from MSD is, yesterday Paula Bennett dropped a number on us, a lot of numbers on us. One of those numbers was 144 million. Um, and it's for one strand of her, 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 um, her portfolio. 16 million for the entire strategy in the housing network. So there's a lot of us in the room that know the numbers and we know we're getting ripped off. So I'd like to remind uh, Don Brash, that's not Māori privilege. So kia ora. Uh, okay, just in terms of the, the security uh, thing again, the. You know, I've been involved in the Kainga Whenua loan for six years uh, since it was introduced and uh, the, I, the way that, or the requirement that uh, houses is, uh, on Māori land in order to access that finance have to be built on piles and therefore be movable has been around for, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, maybe longer, ever since uh, I know Housing New Zealand's been involved since perhaps the mid-80s. So, uh, in that time, I don't think anybody's come up with a way of getting around that requirement uh, in order for uh, security to be taken over the property. The government has made it clear that as far as these loans are concerned, they have to be secured loans. That's gone to Cabinet uh, probably two or three years ago, and Cabinet said that these loans have to be secured loans. So. Uh, if you've got any ideas, uh, then I'm sure that uh, the government would love to hear. The setting of policy around that particular aspect of Kainga Whenua uh, sits outside the responsibility of Housing New Zealand. That becomes an MB responsibility around, uh, around setting policy. So that would be an MB, uh, sorry, MB led uh, conversation, uh, and I'm not aware of any conversations that, or investigations that they are doing around that. I think that uh, to my knowledge, it's been looked at extensively, certainly in the time that I've been involved, and, uh, and it, it's, as far as I'm aware, nobody's ever come up with an idea that's, that works, that satisfies everybody's needs. Um, I'll just get Kay to quickly, yep, and then we I'm going to go. Um, um, yeah, questions. just two, two, two points, I suppose. Um, and I'll just talk, we were, Kay and I were just having a bit of a side, side conversation. Respons policy responsibility for the Kainga Whenua loan scheme is a is a bit of an ambiguity at the moment, and um, and you know and, and that's we take responsibility as public servants to 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 front up for that, and um, whether it's MB, whether it's TPK, or whether it's M MSD, or um, or even Treasury, because the minister responsible for housing New Zealand is is is. Um, as, as, the, as, the, as, the as the Minister of Finance. So 
there is a bit of an ambiguity there. We are certainly identifying these issues um, as the Māori Housing Network. Um, our minister is really concerned about them. He is not, the, as he said you know, yesterday, he is not the Minister of Housing. He's not even, unlike Tariana Turia, he's not even the Associate Minister of Housing. So, so we've got some limited ability to influence that, but we will do our, do our bit. I think, Mike, there are solutions. Um, as I said, in some cases, the risk is, is infant, infinitesimal. And, um, you know, particularly where the loan is only 20% of the total cost, you think, well, we actually, what is actually the risk? and how much you price that risk. The other thing is, I think there is a role for um, ROPU, um, whether it's an Ahu Whenua Trust, or a Fano Trust, or the Land Owning Incorporation, potentially to um, um, provide a bit of an umbrella there for Fano, um, who want to build concrete slabs, or whareuku. Um, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. Um, in terms of the first point, in terms of the voice, in my experience in housing, and I've been in housing for a long time, and, and over in Victoria, it is really, really important to have a strong sector voice. Really, really important. And, um, and one of the things that we're doing as Māori Housing Network is supporting Te Matapihi. And um, I'd really encourage you as a sector uh, to think about how Te Matapihi might be one of your voices. Not the voice, but one of the voices. Um, thank you. I'm going to um, give... This lady over here who's been very patient, the last word. We've run, we've run out of time, but what I was also going to suggest, um, thinking about your comment about solutions and policy and strategy, is a lot of the discussion we're starting to have here now, we've got a big session after lunch, um, and I think that's the place where we can start to actually think about some really good solutions. So um, we won't get to everyone's questions now, but I think we can probably make a good start after lunch in the strategy sessions. But I'll just um, let this lovely lady over here have the last word. Uh, kia ora, Mike. Um, ko bira malataku ingoa, ngā wanganui ahau. Kia ora, everybody. Um, just my question, Mike, in terms of uh, what our eho over here said about the concrete buildings. Uh, we build with concrete and build on concrete slabs and things like that. Now, we, we've got whānau up the river as well that have asked for these homes, but um, they've been turned down for kind of whenua loans because of the concrete. You mentioned in your corridor that there were alternatives that perhaps we could look at around um, that you can't take the house away, but maybe there's an alternative that you can uh, we can come into some agreement with around another asset of something. So what could those assets be? Are we looking at forestry or... Things. It's not that we're going to give you that, but just, um, you know, memorandums of understandings or something like that that could help to bridge those gaps for concrete okay. homes. Yes, so what I was referring to in my presentation was that within the, uh, within the policy of Kāinga Whenua loans, there is an ability for Housing New Zealand to provide an exemption to the requirement that houses be built. Uh, on piles, and that's where Housing New Zealand's able to take security over another asset that um, that meets or exceeds the value of the loan. So, if if a, a person or a uh, Māori land trust or a collective is able to offer an alternative security uh, over another asset, then Housing New Zealand can look at uh, doing that. And in fact, we're in the process of uh, you know having a dis couple of discussions around that at the moment. Uh, in terms of guidance that I could give you around um, that, it it's really would amount to a discussion in, in any particular instance as to what uh, assets that are available that would um, that would meet that requirement. We have investigated just in the last couple of months uh, a, a, an inquiry around a forestry asset that proved to be because of the way that the banking industry looked at uh, forestry assets and the volatility of that value proved to be uh, uh, difficult. So forestry in itself is, is um, uh, challenging, I think, is the word that would be used in terms of that as an asset. Um, we investigated that uh, to a point uh, just in the last couple of months. In terms of uh, other assets, we, the, the reality is that we've only entered into a very few conversations around this and uh, you know the types of assets that have been uh, looked at is, is bank bonds um, and deposits in, uh, in a bank. 
Thank you, oh, Mike. Kia ora. Um, I think this is a really important session. Um, there, we, you know, this is an opportunity for more kōrero to actually happen. Um, one thing I want to point out, and Aubrey um, suggested it, uh, mentioned it, is there's all these barriers that still exist. It's been purposely put in place by the government to inhibit us from living on our whenua Māori, and we need to work together to find solutions. And Mike, your product is just not good enough. People in this room know um, some really good ways to, for us to be able to access uh, the right to live on whenua Māori, and it needs, it needs to happen. Um, the other thing I wanted to say uh, in regards to MSD is um, in the north we have these terms called no-go zones. So our whānau can't live on our whenua because they can't receive a benefit because MSD is classed as a no-go zone. We want our whānau to come home and we can ease the pressure off Auckland if our whānau can actually come back to our whenua Māori. So we need them to be able to transition back to the kainga. We want them, we want to support them and MSD doesn't allow them to come back because of the, these areas being labelled as no-go zones. That needs to change. People, people create industry. We, you know, this thing, oh, there's no, there's no jobs back in the North. Well, there's no people, and that's why. So we need our people to come home to create industry. We want them there, and we want the government to support us to occupy our whenua Māori. And, you know, this is an opportune time for us to keep this dialogue going. Roberts, koutou mā, i kona, tū tātou ki te kōrero. We've been eating the whole time. We can delay lunch a little bit more. Haere tonu ngā kōrero. Oh, I'm just getting a little bit of instruction here, so... Oh, kia ora tato. Just following up um, on uh, the whole, you know, getting funding to be able to, our percentages and stuff and not being able to get to a loan, we definitely have solutions and um, kia ora to um, Robert. We've talked extensively about different options and I'm sure everybody else has got options here, solutions for, for these barriers. But I just wanted to see if you've got a commitment, can we get a commitment from agencies that you're actually going to discuss it? Because we're into 100% sustainability, and that's whareuku for us, and um, we cannot get it anywhere. Cannot get assistance anywhere to build whareuku. These are resources on our land. You know, everyone knows the core at all, but it's just can we get commitment from people to actually make get these solutions happening. Because I was at the last hui in Waitangi, where it was talked about, and nothing's been done since. So kia ora. Sorry, it's quite hard to see from up here, but we have got five minutes more, so I'm gonna head back over this side of the room. Um, microphone. Can I, just, can I just say something here? My name's Very Sharon Wanahe. I'm um, Natahini, yes. and thank you for giving us this opportunity to actually speak to you, but it seems like you guys up on the stage are turning off when we're starting to talk about these things. So I just ask you if you can bring your attention to what we're saying, because it's important to us. So listening to the presentations, um, you talked about safe, secure, health, healthy housing. I'd also like to ask what's missing, what's missing for our people. And to me, sitting here listening, it is access. We've got these wonderful strategies and programs, but how do we access them? There's so much bureaucracy and regulation, we can't get, we can't get to it. We can't get to what you're giving us and offering us. So access and then empowerment. How do you empower the, the tenant, the end user? once they're in there, if they actually get there? How do we keep them empowered as people? Where is the cultural aspects in all of the stuff that you talk about? I can't hear any of it. I was born here and raised in Australia and I've come home. And I can't come home. I can't come home to the way that I'm meant to come home, that I know that's in my heart. All I can come home to is another version of what I had in Australia. It doesn't fill, fill up anything inside me and I can't get my whānau home because of that. So, 
Um, I would ask you to think about solutions that don't enslave us to a system that we're not meant to be in. We have our ways, they work. They're our ways. We, they shouldn't be taken away from us and they shouldn't be limited. How do you measure the effectiveness of what you're doing, of what your programs are doing, are meant to do? Where all this money is, is out there and allocated to us, but who actually sees that money? The bureaucrats, the people who are putting all the strategy and regulation in place, that's where it goes. Is that the best use of money? It's public money. I'm a taxpayer in Australia and here. I pay a lot of tax. But I have no say in it. I have no say in what, what happens where it goes and how effective that is, because it's in your hands, but you don't talk to us. Um, I'm going to suggest that a lot of the things that... Um, Kia ora, Ruth. Ruth. Yeah. Kia ora. Hang on. On. The side, on the side over here, yes. I just wanted to address that kōrero. Um, Kia ora, uh, ite tua hine. Sure. Um, and just very quickly, just want to um, acknowledge the kōrero that is happening in the room and how important it is that we have a dialogue. It is very important. And we are wanting to keep to time, and I don't want to stop anyone from um, benefiting from that. Um, but iti tuahine, if it's okay with you, could we give our panel some time to consider some of these questions that are being asked? Because in a way, we are putting them on the spot, and some of the stuff they aren't prepared for. But let's give them an opportunity to, after lunch, come back with some more considered responses. And then that takes, gives them time to consider that, um, not to let them off the hook. But some of the questions that we're asking are quite big questions. The solutions that we're looking for are really in the room amongst us. We should be guiding that, as Aubrey is saying. Um, so if that's all right, Koto Ma if we can let them have an opportunity to consider some of these very important questions and come back after lunch with some responses. And if not after lunch, Ruth, perhaps at the uh, workshop session, feedback session. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that um, if these guys have a bit of time to have a bit of consideration um, of some answers. But we have um, a couple of hours after lunch in the workshop, and we, the workshop team and the people from the Science Challenge to Matapehi um, community housing, Aotearoa, and anyone else. Um, we're going to meet over lunch anyway to talk about the workshop, so we'll talk about how we can um, maybe structure that in a way that, that maximises that opportunity to think about solutions and have and continue the corridor. Is that good? Right. Um, you're going to do the thank you? Yes. Excellent. And I'm going to start off by some, saying the brown elephant in the room is like, awkward. Hey, look. No, I, I don't mean to undervalue the kōrero keiroto i te piringa nei, because that is really important. I do want to make the point, though, and Ruben, uh, you know, geez, we've had this conversation before. Auntie Tari spoke to us about the gap between policy and strategy, and koto tātoura is still too wide. And that really is the issue, and I agree, Aubrey, and I, I'm hoping for some nice fiery stuff after lunch in amongst those um, strategy workshops. For the meantime, though, and even though you may not want me to say this on behalf of you, the conference, we do want to thank you for turning up. We understand... We understand that you've fronted up today to represent your respective government agencies. We don't agree. Sometimes we don't even like what those agencies are about. But you put a face to those. We know that face now. And um, we probably are going to try and make a beeline for you. So I do want to thank you. And I want to thank you, Ruth, for um, flying in and flying straight up onto the stage to facilitate what was... Um, well, an enthusiastic session with the conference. So thank you very much. So thank you all again um, to our panel. Look, 
It's not easy fronting up in front of a room full of Māori. And I'm Māori. Uh, look, uh, just to say, I had a wee bit of word with the wardens and they were a little bit unhappy because um, Kautaura i tai tō muri mai te atanei you've gone and parked in the disabled parking um, outside. And um, if you don't have a sticker, um, your car technically... Um, should be moved. Whether you're going to go and move it, well, that's a different story. Um, just to, to say, though, I just want to quickly, before I introduce... Oh, no. We'll go to the next speaker, otherwise then I'll be holding things up. Um, but say thank you very much. Um, I'm sure one of our organisers will pull you in before you try and discreetly exit the conference and get some more conversation. Yeah, you can't move your car. It's um, blocked in. We watched you walk in this morning. Okay, so T oh, Tect is the sponsor of our next, um, here's my buddy over here, this is Wayne Wooder, and um, Wayne's going to speak to us a little bit. Um, I think he's coming into friendly territory. Wayne is the general manager at the Tauranga Energy Consumer Trust. Um, born in Te Aroha, raised in Hamilton, now living here in Tauranga. Conference 2016, Mr Wayne Wuda. Ah, kia ora, kia ora tatu. I feel like I've just stopped a really important conversation, so I'm feeling, feeling quite guilty. The other thing I know is that I'm the only thing between you and lunch, which I also feel a bit uh, <laughs> guilty about. <laughs> uh, look, I, I just want to spend a bit of time um, not going into the, the deep and dark details of the Tauranga Energy Consumer Trust, but just to probably give you another perspective of um, where community funding might live and just give you a bit of an insight into some work that we've done here in the Bar Plenty um, in collaboration with the other funders, uh, particularly around housing. And I think um, what it will hopefully lead to is some really interesting conversations and hopefully some really interesting solutions for uh, some quite in-depth issues that, are, that we're facing at the moment in housing. My daughter, um, I've got three daughters, I don't know what I've done to deserve that, but I left this morning and I said I was going to go talk to a, a big group of people and, and she said, oh, you have to take jokes to the, if you're going to go talk to people. And I said, well, I don't know any jokes. And she said, oh, we'll try this one. A man walks into a zoo. In that zoo, there was only one animal, a dog. That was a shit zoo. <laughs> She then, she then told me she didn't understand it. <laughs> so look, just a, a quick rundown on the uh, Tauranga Energy Consumer Trust. We are one of 26 energy trusts that exist in New Zealand. You'll probably know from your own regions, if you're from other places in New Zealand, um, the various types of energy trusts, they are quite different. But the one in uh, Tauranga is obviously called the Tauranga Energy Consumer Trust, and we have six trustees and three staff. I am the general manager of, um, of that trust. We are a, what's called a consumer trust, not a charitable trust or not a community trust, which is quite important in one way in the fact that we have beneficiaries as opposed to just looking after the community at large. Essentially anyone here who has a trust power, power account and lives in Western Bay is considered a consumer of our trust. So everything that we do has to be somehow directly linked to benefiting those beneficiaries. And so we do that in two ways. We provide a cheque every November. So people here are from Western Bay and have got a trust power account will receive a tech cheque in November, which is essentially a, a rebate on the power that you pay. The second way that we provide benefit is indirectly to those consumers by a grants program. So each year we give out about $10 million uh, in a variety of ways uh, to various grants. And the theory behind that is if we can make Western Bay a better place to live, then, then that is how we justify that there is direct benefit to those consumers. So the vision of Tech is about our consumers living in an, and are engaged in a vibrant and enriching community. When we start to think about housing and we start to think about just some of the basic infrastructure, a, a roof over your head, 
and then we talk about being vibrant and enriching, it kind of really hits home that, you know, there's some really basic things in the community that we need to get right before we do the, the things on top of that. And then <coughs> housing, to me, is one of those areas where we have sort of lost control of a really important area, and we need to really work hard together to, to find some um, quite innovative solutions. So I've talked a little bit about the money we give out. It looks like big numbers, and, and it is for a, for a region like Western Bay. Nine million is a, quite a significant sum. I also look back over what tech has put into housing in the last five years, and we've funded over $4 million into housing-related projects across the Western Bay, which is quite a significant sum. If you, if you put that in the context of the housing sector, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean, but certainly for a trust like ourselves, it is quite a significant sum. I'll just run through quickly a couple of the um, sort of areas that we have committed to over the years. We've um, funded quite heavily into home insulation, uh, $2.5 million since 2006. We've largely just uh, partnered with the government's ECA scheme there, but what that has allowed is 2,500 houses to be insulated over, over a period of time. Uh, we've also supported a number of um, Papakoinga developments and um, I just want to take the time to acknowledge uh, Victoria Kingi and Linda Carroll and the team at Papakoinga uh, Papa Solutions Limited. They are um, sort of what I would call almost repeat offenders or repeat visitors to TECT. <laughs> they've, they've, <laughs> they've certainly got a load of ideas, a load of projects and I think it's fantastic that they keep knocking on our door for support in various ways. And, and I love what, what they're doing in this space, and it's not just them, but I just love this whole Papakoinga solutions, uh, Papakoinga developments, mainly for the sense it's, it's not so much about building houses, it's about building communities, and I think something in that is uh, what we need to think about when we're talking about this housing issue. It's not so much about individual houses. Somehow in New Zealand we need to start building communities. So Tech over the years has been a fairly minor player in these developments and, and what we've tended to help out is, is the fit out and um, for a lot of the ones that I've just put on the screen there around some of the electrical fit out. There are other um, housing uh, providers that we've um, supported, Tauranga Community Housing Trust, Habitat for Humanity, a number of different organisations doing some great things in this housing space and um, all doing really well-meaning stuff. But I guess if we look at the issues that exist in housing, we need to, to do more is kind of the key message. So then if we step back a bit and consider the other funders that are in the Bay of Plenty, if I join the other um, two energy trusts, so uh, Rotorua Energy Trust and the Eastern Bay, also the Bay Trust, which is a community trust here in the Bay of Plenty, and the Acorn Foundation, which is a philanthropic trust, um, We've committed over $10 million in the last five years between us to housing-related projects, and you can see in that graph there that about two-thirds of it has been dedicated to healthy homes and uh, home insulation. So a significant sum of money, and one that sort of got us thinking that if you pick up the paper every day, there are issues around housing, are we doing the right thing with the, with the funding that we have? So what it's led to is us working together about looking forward how can our investment, our $10 million, if that's what we've got over in the next five years, how can that make the greatest impact into a sector that has such significant um, issues and in, in want of so many significant solutions? So what we did, I'll just skip through there. we ended up um, jointly commissioning a piece of housing research. So the three energy trusts, Bay Trust and Acorn Foundation, contracted a crowd called CSI. I thought it was the uh, guys from the TV show when I first heard of them, but Centre for Social Impact, who, who do quite a bit of work in Auckland. They've, they've, been, um, they've come out of the ASB Trust, which is now called Foundation North. So, and in fact, the, one of the key researchers is down the back of the room, Lisa Hickling, who uh, to helped us pull this report together. <coughs> so we asked Lisa and her team to go away and, and look around New Zealand and look around internationally from a funder's perspective, a community funder's perspective, as to what is best practice, what are funders in New Zealand and around the world doing in this housing space to really make a significant impact with what tends to be quite a small amount of money in the scale of, uh, of the housing sector. 
The other thing we asked her to do was to go around to the people that know a lot more about housing than we do and talk to them. So we, we, um, we got Lisa and her team to go around and talk to um, about 20 people who were working in the space in the Bay of Lenny particularly and really knew the space inside out. And then we asked her to package that up into some kind of report that would allow us to then be able to, to make decisions and implement plans and actions at our trust to be able to invest in, in the solutions. So we end up with a paper called The Sustainable Housing in, in the Bay of Plenty, a strategic advice paper. There's a lot of, little bit of debate at the start about sustainable housing, and I suspect across these conferences you, you debate this endlessly. To me, it doesn't really matter what the definition of sustainable housing is. We landed on one that I think is quite common, that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs which I think is quite a common, common way of explaining sustainable housing. And as consultants do, this is one of the first themes we got back, a picture that terrified me when I first saw it. And to me, the only theme that we're really going to get out of that picture is this is an incredibly complex sector. Multiple players, multiple issues. Where do you even start to make an impact? Is it on the supply side? Is it on the demand side? So I guess the key theme without Digging into the detail of that is that there is no one silver bullet that's going to solve all these issues. The other theme that came out for us was that we had been essentially operating in the left-hand side of that chart, sort of what they've called traditional philanthropy. People apply to us, we, we make grants. Across a year, we'd make a whole lot of grants. In, funding, in the funding world, there's this term called spray and pray. And I think that's essentially what we've been doing. We've been handing out lots of little bits of money to lots of groups, all well-meaning. You couldn't argue that any of them were, were not trying to achieve good things, but we essentially we were spraying and praying that some of them would, uh, would make a difference. <clears throat> Clearly, where we need to get to as funders is move to the right of that chart and get a bit more strategic with the way that we fund. Fund with a long-term vision, not so much a short-term vision. And if we can move that way, I think, the only way we can do that is understanding the issues better and then trying to find solutions that meet the root causes. So, so that's certainly what the uh, challenge we've set ourselves is to try and move to the right of that. But to do that, we're going to have to talk and partner with a lot more people that know a lot more about this housing space than we do, e.g. all of you. So four key areas. I think if you ran a report on housing in any region in New Zealand, you'd probably come up with a similar sort of list. This is for the Bay of Plenty, housing availability and suitability. Loads of three and four bedroom houses, well not loads, but in predominantly three and four bedroom houses. People needing one or two just can't find the stock and, and very few incentives for developers to build uh, smaller, smaller houses when they, they're getting rid of the houses that they're building before they even start. Housing quality, even though we have um, committed funding to insulate 2,500 houses, we still have a massive amount of housing stock that is not healthy to live in or safe. And housing affordability, well, you only have to pick up a newspaper any day of the week to see that housing affordability is a massive issue in this country. And uh, particularly in Tauranga, where we're getting quite a bit of spillover from the Auckland market, housing affordability is, is crazy at the moment. <clears throat> And the other one, which again is not rocket science, but is a really good reminder, this, this whole notion that the only way we're going to be able to be successful is if we collaborate. So this whole notion of collective impact, I think, is one that the five funders have certainly got serious on and are very much committed to working together and with the sector to try and make a difference here. So just to um, give you a feel, it's hot off the press, this report, so we haven't really got any action plans, but the seven areas that were identified for us where we could potentially make a difference were around direct investment in housing stock or land. Interesting times at the moment when you think of our investment portfolios and we try and put money in the bank, the interest rates are so low that you now question whether that's worth it, so potentially buying property might be a better way of these funds actually achieving what they don't want to achieve. Social lending, shared equity schemes, potential for us to partner up with other, other people. Housing loan guarantor, very interesting discussion that you just had with the government around that. Grants and strategic funds, which is kind of what we've been doing, but clearly we need to be a bit more strategic. Developing community housing provider capability. Because we need to accept that we're not going to be able to solve this issue ourselves, perhaps it's about working with those that are in this space and really developing their capability and capacity to be able to do more. 
And the final one's advocacy, something that we as funders have not really been involved in that heavily in the past. But perhaps if, if locally here in the Bay of Plenty, um, the funders can make a bit of a noise every now and again and become a, a voice in itself, then maybe that would be a way of really moving the dial in a really difficult industry. So the next steps for us, essentially we've got three, three areas, ring fence, emergency housing, healthy, healthy housing and housing stock. And we've committed to locking ourselves in a room, um, one with ourselves, but more importantly two with the industry experts to really develop a, a decent plan for how we can invest as community funders into this area. And I love the potential opportunity that we have with Māori when I look at some of the things that are happening, particularly in Bay of Plenty. I think it's quite a special time for us to really try some quite innovative things here in the Bay of Plenty. And certainly there's a willingness across the funders to uh, to be a bit brave and um, have a go. That's me, I can smell lunch. Are there any burning questions related to this topic? Don't try and start going back to the last. No, there are. Look, um, thank you for coming. This is a little bit of a thank you um, from the team and um, for participating in our conference today, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very thank you. much. Okie dokie. Well, just before we break for lunch, I just want to go over the...